Coming up on Cronkite News, fentanyl overdose cases are rising. We'll discuss what can be done to solve this problem in Arizona. Depression rates are statistically higher among LGBTQ youth. One teen's journey through the disease and where you can find help. And later, the Oscars are returning to Los Angeles this weekend. We'll take a look at the financial impacts the award show has on that city. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News in Arizona PBS. I'm Fatma Abed. And I'm Raven Payne. Thank you for joining us. Today, the Arizona House passed a ban on abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. The bill is now headed to Governor Doug Ducey's desk for his signature. The House voted along party lines on the bill, which explicitly does not ban abortion outright. The bill has no exceptions for rape, incest, or for a medical emergency in which the mother's life is at risk. This measure mirrors the Mississippi law that's now before the U.S. Supreme Court. Those against the bill say it's a family matter when it comes to abortion, while groups in support say the bills look after the mother's best interest. Today was, um, you know, a darker day for Arizona. I think it was a copycat of some of the more draconian measures we've seen um, passing around the country as they try to attack women's reproductive rights. So this is a reasonable measure to restrict abortion after 15 weeks. It also protects the health and safety of the mother. Um, the later in pregnancy that a woman has an abortion, the greater increased risk to her health and well-being. So Senate Bill 1164 is a win-win for unborn children and their mothers. Governor Ducey has signed every piece of abortion legislation that has passed his desk since he took office. Also at the state legislature, the House passed a bill that would prohibit gender reassignment surgery. The bill now heads to the governor's desk, but it's unclear if he will sign it. Two other Republican governors refused to sign similar legislation in Utah and Indiana. Advocates for transgender youth say decisions about children's health should be left up to those children, their parents, and their doctors. Supporters of the legislation say teens shouldn't undergo irreversible surgeries. LGBTQ teens are more likely to experience symptoms of depression, according to health experts. Cronkite News reporter Liz Flores spoke with one young man who is opening up about his own struggles in order to help others. His childhood was tough. This young person says he was bullied because of sexual orientation, but he didn't give up fighting for who he is. Carlos Maldonado was six years old when he realized he was not like his classmates. Like I could sit there and giggle and laugh at the girl, but when I would giggle and laugh at the boy, I would get butterflies in my stomach. He remembers that his peers did not accept him and bullied him to the point where he felt alone. There was always some kids that always knocked me down. They would always call me names. I'd just make fun of the way I dressed just because I just was out of, always thought out of the box the way I dressed. The Anxiety and Depression Association of America indicates that LGBTQ plus teens are six times more likely to experience symptoms of depression than their heterosexual counterparts. Higher risk group. Chief Those Medical Officer at Sounder Mind, um, Doug Newton, emphasizes that. how depression can affect someone beyond the scope of what many generally think anger or just not being able to sleep or having not any energy. A 2021 report from the National Survey on LGBTQ Youth Mental Health indicates 40% of LGBTQ seriously considered attempting suicide in the past 12 months. Newton encourages those with depression or other mental illnesses to not suffer in silence. Making sure that honor yourself and seek the help because it is, uh, it is out there and these are very treatable, and it's really good to understand for many people that it is on the increase and unfortunately is very common. Mental health expert says that it's important for people suffering from any mental illness to find a provider that understands the connection between sexual orientation and mental health. Maldonado was able to recover from depression, and now at 22, he says he is very happy with who he is. I was able to stand up for myself. Everybody knew who I was, and. Exactly. With his story, Maldonado hopes to send a message to people who may be suffering from depression or other conditions that there is help available. In the newsroom, Liz Flores, Cronkite News. Today marked the fourth day of confirmation hearings 
for U.S. Supreme Court nominee Katanji Brown Jackson. If appointed, Jackson will be the first public defender to become a Supreme Court justice in three decades. Throughout the hearings, Jackson described her judicial neutrality and methodology. The hearings also included some heated exchanges. Republican senators alleged that Jackson was soft on crime and had questions related to the judge's previous rulings on child pornography cases. Some senators also questioned her opinions on critical race theory. Despite the scrutiny she faced, Jackson was still able to draw focus towards how she hopes to inspire others in her possible new role. I am here standing on the shoulders of generations of Americans who never had anything close to this kind of opportunity. So this nomination against that backdrop is significant to, to a lot of people. And I hope that it will bring confidence. It will help inspire people to understand that our courts are like them, that our judges are like them. The Senate Judiciary Committee will vote on the judge's nomination on April 4th. If the committee votes in favor, Jackson will become the first black woman ever to serve on the Supreme Court. What started as a pharmaceutical drug used to treat severe pain has now become a leading cause of overdose, and death rates are only continuing to rise. Concrete News reporter Madison Thomas spoke to individuals in all different fields to learn why this is happening and what should be done about it. According to federal data, there was a national increase of roughly 20,000 overdose deaths involving synthetic opioids from 2019 to 2020. Fentanyl is believed by many to be the most dangerous drug in America. I've been in law enforcement for well over 25 years, and this is the most terrifying thing I have seen is this fentanyl crisis. Fentanyl can be up to 100 times stronger than morphine. The DEA reports that four out of every 10 pills with fentanyl has a potentially lethal dose. They think that's oh, a little pill. It can't be that hard. It looks like an aspirin. I'm going to take that and um, it could be deadly. Arizona State Senator Christine Marsh sponsored a bill last year that legalized drug test strips, which tell people what is in the pill they are taking. This came after she tragically lost her own son to a fentanyl overdose. His death had a huge effect on the direction I was going with legislation. Senator Marsh says her son was not a drug user. He traveled down to Tucson with some friends where they believe he purchased what he thought was a Percocet. Landon would want, like, me or, you know, his death. He was so practical. I think he would want, like, his death to potentially result in something positive. Making test strips illegal has helped the organization Shot in the Dark legally be able to supply them to people in need. It makes people feel a little safer testing stuff and being like, okay, there, yeah, there for sure is, right? It might, uh, it might sway the person to use a little differently or a little safer at that point. Shot in the Dark is a syringe service program that travels across the Phoenix area, providing people with harm reductive resources. We're not focused on abstinence or anything like that. Our job is to keep people alive long enough for them to reach some form of recovery. Jonathan Martinez says that addiction can happen to anyone. It could be a soccer mom. It could be uh, assistant chief of police. It could be anybody. Um, just because it's not happening to you directly does not mean that it's not happening everywhere around. Dr. Foster Olive believes a strong step in combating this opioid epidemic is to find new forms of pain relievers. I think in terms of like if there was some sort of way to create a very, very good pain reliever that is not addictive and not necessarily an opioid, you know, maybe it's a different molecule that which we don't understand how it works, but it somehow doesn't interact with the brain. Uh, you know, mechanisms of addiction. One common message rang loud and clear from everyone. All it can take is one time. One pill can be a death sentence. I'm living my, you know, I'm, I'm living that reality. If you are struggling with addic addiction and need help, the Arizona Department of Health Services hotline number is 1-888-688-4222. In the newsroom, Madison Thomas, Cronkite News. The economy appears to be improving when it comes to unemployment. The number of Americans filing for unemployment dropped last week 
to the lowest number in more than 52 years. According to the Labor Department, jobless claims dropped to 187,000 last week, which is down by 28,000. That's the lowest number we've seen since September of 1969. All of this happening despite the ongoing pandemic and increasing prices. The four-week average for jobless claims also decreased to a number not seen in about 50 years. Coming up after the break, celebrities will be taking the stage this weekend at the Oscars. We'll let you know just how much of an impact the award show has on Los Angeles. Plus, how Governor Doug Ducey is already making preparations way ahead of the country's 250th anniversary in 2026. What you get from Washington Week that you will not get anywhere else are the best and the brightest reporters from different media companies, and they're able to have a real conversation about things that are happening in Washington and around the country. But it's also a show about issues that are relevant to different communities. How do you think that as the moderator, I feel this deep responsibility to bring in those other perspectives so that people understand how power and politics impact their daily lives. Friday nights at 7 on Arizona PBS. It's Oscar season, which means thousands of people around the world are getting ready to watch this glamorous event. But how much is actually spent on making it happen? Karen Marikin is in Los Angeles to explain. From the red carpet to the statuettes and the glitz and glam, every year millions of dollars are spent to stage and air the Oscars. According to Wallet Hub, this year the ceremony will cost $42.9 million. Vincent Brooke, retired media studies lecturer at the University of California, Los Angeles, tells us why. The Academy Awards has prestige. You know, it's a major part of Hollywood history. It began in 1929. And at its height, at its peak, it was bigger than the Super Bowl by a big margin. Nearly $25,000 are spent just on the 50,000 square feet of red carpet the stars walk across. And $400 are spent on each 24-karat gold-plated statuette. But that's not the end of it. Get this. An Oscars goodie bag given to nominees is valued at more than $200,000. And the cost of an A-list actress's ensemble can go up to $10 million. Here at the Dolby Theater, preparations are underway. And workers will spend nearly 900 hours installing this red carpet behind me before Sunday's event. And all that hard work pays off. LA's annual economic boost from this event is estimated to top $130 million. Macy Todd, assistant professor in the English department and director of film studies at SUNY Buffalo State, says this number could potentially increase. I think the more that the movie industry is able to keep pace with the rest of media and the kind of inclusive, diverse perspectives that we're seeing, especially through streaming, the better that they're going to perform financially. So whether you're recording the show or watching it in real time, just know you're witnessing one of the most expensive and glamorous events of the year. In Los Angeles, Karen Marroquin, Cronkite News. The Oscars are set to take place this Sunday, March 27th at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time at the Dolby Theater in Hollywood. The United States 250th anniversary isn't until 2026. It may seem like a long time away, but preparations are already being made right here in the Valley, way ahead of the celebration. Yesterday, Governor Doug Ducey signed into law a bill that established the, Air the Arizona America 250 Commission. That commission will be tasked with helping plan the celebration. Governor Ducey said this is aimed not only at celebrating the founding of our country, but also to help with education. He said this will be a, quote, once-in-a-lifetime experience for Arizonans. Arizona is now among 21 other states that also created similar commissions to help with the celebration. 
Phoenix residents are starting to feel some of those summer-like high temperatures. Let's check in with Faith Abercrombie and the Cronkite Weather Center for our forecast. Yes, even though Sunday was the official start to springtime, hello summer with these warm temperatures that we've been seeing all along the West Coast, not only in Arizona, as you can see in Southern California, we're seeing those 70 degree temperatures as, as our high. In Bakersfield, they're almost nearing 90 degrees. As we take a look into Arizona, about 86 degrees was our high temperature for today, but it's going to warm up quite a bit over the weekend. Now, as we take a look into Northern Arizona, similar to Southern California with 71 degrees as their high temperature in the Grand Canyon tomorrow, 69 degrees as their high in Flagstaff. So if you're looking to take a weekend trip, it might be a good idea. As we take a look at our high temperatures across the valley tomorrow, we're gonna see 94 degrees in Phoenix, similar temperatures all over, pretty warm. Now we won't feel that heat quite yet tonight, we're going to dip off into the 70 degree temperatures. It won't hit 60 degrees until about 1 a.m. But taking a look at our eight day forecast, we're going to see 96 degrees on Saturday, 94 on Sunday. But looking into the rest of the week, we're going to see 67 degrees on Tuesday, but jumping back up into 78 on Wednesday and 81 on Thursday. Well, that is your eight day forecast from the Weather Center. I'm Faith Abercrombie. Time for sports. Coming up after the break, I'm Andrew Curlin, and on the Cronkite Sports Report, we'll give you a special look at tonight's Sweet 16 matchup between U Arizona and Houston. We'll have more from San Antonio on the big matchup coming up. What you get from Washington Week that you will not get anywhere else are the best and the brightest reporters from different media companies, and they're able to have a real conversation about things that are happening in Washington and around the country. But it's also a show about issues that are relevant to different communities. How do you think that As the moderator, I feel this deep responsibility to bring in those other perspectives so that people understand how power and politics impact their daily lives. Friday nights at 7 on Arizona PBS. Cronkite News. I'm Andrew Curland, and this is your Cronkite Sports Report. The Sweet 16 is here, and you Arizona fans are counting down the minutes until the Wildcats tip off against Houston tonight. Cronkite News reporter Colt Amadova is in San Antonio with more of the top seeds improbable run. To start the season, Arizona was unranked, picked to finish fourth in the Pac-12, and we're beginning a new era under first-year head coach Tommy Lloyd. Now, would you look at that in the second weekend of March Madness? Arizona is in the Sweet 16, aiming to keep this remarkable journey going. Right now, it's, uh, it's win or go home, so there's no pressure. Everybody's confident they can win, so we just got to play our game and uh, follow the instruction the coaches have, follow the game plan, and believe in ourselves play together as a team and I don't think there's any pressure. The Cats have fed off the resilience of sophomore guard Kirk Creesa, who came off the bench in Sunday's overtime victory against TCU. Creesa is still nursing an ankle injury from the Pac-12 tournament, but going into the South Regional semifinal against Houston, Coach Lloyd hopes to have his floor general and spark plug ready to go. Kerr's a lot of bark and, and sometimes a little bite, you know, and uh, and obviously you guys see the personality and the antics and, 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 and he's an emotional emotional player and he's having fun is, is what he's doing. Uh, he's easy to coach. I mean, he listens. He gives you eye contact. He's got a high IQ. Um, I, I haven't had any issues with him, you know, coaching wise all year. And, uh, and, and and I'll roll with him every day of the week. His ankle continues to make progress. And, you know, we just, you know, we still take it on a day by day basis. My ankle is doing better. Uh, I'm happy we got through, uh, through the first two, uh, two games. I uh, gave me extra days to to keep doing rehab, uh, let my ankle, you know, come better, and uh, I feel like I, I have benefited a lot from the past two, three days. 
Tonight will be a battle between Houston's defense that has held opponents to 37% shooting from the field, which is tops in the nation, and Arizona's high-flying offense that has scored 84 points per game. Expect a lot of Cougar fans in the stands tonight, as Houston is only a three-hour drive away from AT&T Center right behind me. But you already know that the Wildcat faithful that's going to make the trip from Tucson is going to bring it as well. Expect a sea of red in the stands tonight. In San Antonio, at the Sweet 16, Colt Almodova, Cronkite News. Here's some sweet numbers for the Wildcats. They are 2-0 in San Antonio, 3-0 playing five seeds, 3-0 playing on March 24th, and 8-0 on Thursdays. Could be random, or the numbers could be on their side. We'll see. The Suns are playing in Denver on the second night of back-to-back -back road games. And how about this? Chris Paul is listed as probable. Last night, they pushed their win streak to six games over the Timberwolves, backed by a career-high 35 points from DeAndre Ayton. And I told the guys, you know, 59 wins is, is pretty cool to get the um, division. Um, is pretty cool, and, and we have a a motto of celebrating everything because there's a lot of people that sacrifice and work hard so that we can enjoy these moments. For the first time since the pandemic, the Finley Toyota Center in Prescott Valley welcome back the Harlem Globetrotters. Cronkite News reporter Gareth Kwok takes a look at the changing sports and entertainment scene at the arena. About 2,000 fans filed into the Findlay Toyota Center in Prescott Valley for a night of slam dunks and surprises from the Harlem Globetrotters. It's a lot of fun for the kids in the area, the families. Um, it's just, it's a fun, good, feel-good show. The Globetrotters ran up and down the Northern Arizona Suns court, who left Prescott Valley a year and a half ago, leaving some fans longing for minor league hoops again. The main reason I came is because of the Nas Suns, and and now that they're uh, not here, I don't ever really go here. The Naz Wranglers indoor football team is the only remaining professional team in Prescott Valley, but the multi-purpose arena has now turned to a variety of events to entertain fans and families, from concerts, ice skating, and bull riding. The versatility, like you can have one day like a band and then one day bull riding and then monster trucks, it's, it's fun all around. I thought there wasn't gonna be anything for me to do and I found that because of this, there's lots for me to do. They used to have the Sun Dogs in here and it was super exciting. Uh, I heard a lot about the, the AZ or the Northern Arizona Suns, um, about their games and how exciting they were. So I think, you know, I think the community would definitely welcome it. While fans hope for another professional team, the arena celebrated its 15th birthday back in November and the support has stayed strong throughout. Everybody is so excited to be a part of anything here and um, all the local businesses are really excited about all the attention that we have. So it's exciting and, you know, instead of begging people to come, everybody's actually already excited. In Prescott Valley, Gareth Kwok, Cronkite News. The ASU men's swim team is in Atlanta competing in the NCAA men's swim and dive championships and they're looking to make some history. After finishing out day one yesterday, the team is currently tied for fifth place. And if the Sun Devils can pull off a top 10 finish, that will be their first time since 2003. The NCAA Swim and Dive Championships will conclude on Saturday. Well, that does it for this one of the Cronkite Sports Report. Raven, back to you. Coming up, the Arizona Science Center celebrated a unique birthday today. Meet some of the Science Center's slowest members and how you can see them in action. Your favorite member benefit is getting better and bigger. This is wonderful. Over the next year, Passport is adding new shows and doubling the number of episodes for you to stream. They give us all that they've got. From your favorite cooking and travel series. Even the stairs are breathtaking. To history specials and award-winning documentaries. Better and bigger. That really is the fun part. Stream on any device with Passport on the PBS Video app.
Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications Phoenix Sports Bureau provides students with hands-on learning experiences and opportunities in sports journalism. From covering local high schools, colleges, and the pros, students get the opportunity to go live from our Facebook shows covering local, collegiate, and pro sports in the Valley. From digital reporting, broadcast, social media, and producing, there's opportunities for all. For more, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. It's looking to be a slow but exciting day at the Arizona Science Center, where today is Sash the Sloth's birthday. Animal care specialists presented her with a special birthday treat at a presentation this afternoon. Sash is a new addition to the survival of the slowest exhibit at the Science Center, where species living on the laid back side of their life use their disadvantages to survive. The exhibit explores the lives of not just sloths, but also chameleons, snakes, and iguanas, among many other species. The exhibit is here until August 7, 2022, and you can get your tickets online at azscience.org. That's it for Conkite News tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to conkitenews.azpbs.org.